So hi everyone, thank you for watching. And today I have the absolute honor of being with the ghost himself, Kelly Pavlik, former WBC, WBO, Ring Magazine and Lineal middleweight champion of the world. Um, obviously Kelly really needs no introduction from me, but I'd like to give one anyway. Shared the ring with some amazing names, Edison Miranda, Bernard, no. and, Joe Martin, oh, and quite a few others. Um, obviously Jermaine Taylor twice, that goes without saying. Never been stopped as a professional in 42 fights, and uh, currently running the, the um, running his own podcast known as The Punchline with uh, Kelly Pavlik and James Dominguez. I think I'm saying that right. Uh, I think yep. I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and uh, I think you've got a few other things going on. So that's a little introduction. But uh, I, obviously, I appreciate you making the time to talk with me, champ. And uh, oh, no problem. first and foremost, um, thanks for getting on. And um, thank you for your patience with Zoom just now as well. I can't. I, I can't win. I'm, I'm at my outside my gym, and uh, I got people inside lifting weights, loud music, everything else. And then between that, I got uh, people cutting grass on the side of me. So can't. We'll do the best we can with the noise. Um, uh, that's okay. That's okay. I, I go. I went in my car. I'm, I'm barricaded in here. But yeah, man. You know, everything's going good. I, I'm all over the place. Um, you know, nonstop, but that's a good thing. You know, uh, you got to stay busy. So you got a lot of, a lot of things, hands, a lot of things right now, which is good and, uh, and, and active. So. Excellent. Okay. Good stuff. All right, then. So starting at the beginning, um, I'm going to start, I'm going to start with an easy one, which I, I probably should know the answer to this, but I actually don't. In the very beginning, the, the name of the ghost. Yeah. Where did that actually come from in, in the very beginning? Was it your boxing ability or was it for another reason? Or what was the actual story um, behind that? Yeah, there was actually both, uh, two different things. Um, but it was all a coincidence. So I had, um, beginning of my boxing, yeah, actually all the way up to like the first handful of pro fights, um, I was a really slick fighter. I was uh, sharp, make people miss, um, all that. And I went to a tournament. It was the Golden Gloves in, in Cleveland. And I was in there, and I was just boxing people's ears off. I was making a miss, um, beating them up. And, and I was one of the only white kids in the tournament. And they just started calling me Ghost. <clears throat> I came home from that fight. This was the VHS days. I came home. I had the video. I showed my brother because he couldn't go. And he watched it, and he seen my defense. And he goes, man, you move like a ghost in there. And uh, it was just kind of a coincidence, and it, it stuck. Uh, you know, not too many people had that nickname. And from there, you know, that's, that's we kept it. You know, it was, it was uh, not many like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I was just curious because it, it stands out. I mean, it's not the type of name that you hear. It's, it's very memorable. Now, another thing, I mean, you mentioned, um, obviously, your, your early days of your career. Uh, I'm talking pro career now. Now, obviously, you turned pro at, at a young age. Um, one of the things that, that interests me, I mean, did you always believe in the early days that you would be world champion? Was that always on your mind? Was, was there ever any doubt? Or did you just always believe that you'd get to the, the, the top of the mountain, if that makes sense? Uh, I believe that. Um, you know, the big thing with boxing is this. Uh, when you get signed by a big-time promotional company, Obviously, they know that's their job. Um, it's like a major league baseball scout. You know, they're not going to go just pick somebody up to pick them up and put them on the on the team. You know, boxing uh, promoters they have stables. It costs them more fighters they got on, more money it costs them. They got to keep those guys active. <clears throat> a lot of these um, promoters and promotional companies they lose money throughout the year with getting these uh, young prospects and everything. So. Long story short, for a, a big time promotional company to sign you, there has to be something there. Unless you have another um, big part of as far as marketing, you know, that, that might be the only other time, you know. Um, for the most part, though, when you get picked up by uh, a promotional company, it's because they, they believe in you. So, right then and there, coming out of the amateurs, I was winning national tournaments. I was young, I was uh, JO. And I was able to go in there and just dominate people with a little bit of experience that I had. And then when you have a promotional company like Top Rank signing you, right there you have that confidence. You're starting to believe. Like, you know that there, that there's a reason behind it. So, um, yeah, I do that. I was capable of winning a world title. Uh, it's a long road, though, you know, starting off at the beginning. I mean, you got to climb your way up. And um, 
you know, we did that. But, yeah, I always had that in the back of my head. Like, I knew it was realistic that I could win a world title. Yeah. That's a good insight. It's a good insight, especially for any fighters watching this that are obviously not at that stage yet, but they're working their way up. It's, it's a good uh, hope. Well, it's a good hope. For yeah, them. you know, not being mean, you hear a lot, a lot of times. It's always the, uh, well, if I would have had a promoter or they would have had a promoter, they would have been world champs. And like I said, if you got if you got that much chance of winning a world title, well, for the most part, a promoter will sign you. Yeah. Because yeah. even though it costs them money to – it's hard to explain. It costs them money to bring you up. But once you, if you can become a world champion, they could redeem something back out of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, promoters get a bad knock. And, and listen, the boxing business is brutal. But – same time, hey, that's their money that they're fronting up. People don't realize that. You know, they pay, and that's out of their pocket. Um, so they're really picky when they, they go to pick fighters. And, you know, if you have a chance of winning a world title and helping them out, they're, they're going to sign you. If you don't have a chance of winning a world title, they're not going to sign you. Mm. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. I mean, boxing is a business at the end of the day, um, more than a sport. So, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Now, another thing that, that really interests me is obviously your hometown. Um, and the reason it interests me is obviously, first and foremost, for anyone watching that doesn't know, uh, Youngstown has produced a number of um, world champions and you know, top boxers over the, uh, over the years, uh, a number of NFL players as well. I didn't know as many until I was researching for this. But obviously, you've always lived there. I mean, you, you're born there, raised there, grew up there, um, you, you know, become famous there. And, you know, you've always had the connection. And I mean, I don't know, but I, I guess you still live there now. Um, yeah, right on the outskirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, with that in mind, what is it like to um, have that process where you grow up somewhere, you know, you know, I mean, obviously it's not a big place, um, you know, from what I know. And then, you, you know, you become famous, you become a, a, an internationally known world champion, but you're still in the same place. I don't really have one question, but that must be an interesting experience to have on a number of levels. It is, and, and it could be bad and it could be good. Um, unfortunately, uh, Especially in this area, you know, um, big fish, small pond, you, you can't be you. Um, you know, it's uh, it's weird, but it, it happens. Uh, but it is crazy because shit changes overnight. You know what I mean? It's just one of them things. But And I imagine all athletes, you know, they get – athletes get it um, good and bad for, no matter what the situation is. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's cool, but it, it definitely – and it has its perks, but at the same time, it definitely has its um, downside to it. So, yeah. you know, it, it, it is what it is. But, uh, yeah, it, it all hits you. And it's hard to ask me that now because, you know, it's been 13 years since I won the world title. You know, when it first happened, yeah, everything was hunky-dory and, and all that. But you slowly started seeing – the change in people um, after winning a world title. You know, there's, like I said, there's a lot that comes with it. And I don't know if there was enough time to explain um, everything that happened. So, yeah, you know, there's some big changes. I mean, that is a question that I do have for you that I'd like to go into a little bit um, is obviously, yeah, I mean, some of the changes that, that you did experience because. I've, I've obviously I've interviewed quite a few world champions and they all have a different perspective on, on what it feels like, what the experience is like. But for you, it's a little different because you were still obviously sort of in your own uh, old neighborhood. You know, you were still around that and you were experiencing these changes. So, um, mm -hmm. and I, yeah, I know we, we might not have enough time to go into all of it, but like one or two of the, of the biggest things that that, that changed, um, what would they be? Well, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, okay, you know, yeah. that, that's the big thing, and I'm just you know, I tell everybody I just did a couple of interviews yesterday, and I'm tired of like you know, beating around the bush. And I'm I call bluebird blue. Um, it's uh, if you don't do or if you're not around, or if you don't go certain places and you don't talk to people, you are now too good for everyone. Mm -hmm. If you go to them places and you hang out and you act like everyone now you got issues and you're no good and you're a piece of crap or that your career is failing. Um, it's, you know, and, and a small area like this, I mean, it happens all over, but not to the magnitude of here, you know, um, it's a struggling area and people, unfortunately you got a lot of great people and you got a lot that ain't it. And if they're struggling, they want other people struggling. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
and that's it's a small town type thing. Um, again, you know, I'm not knocking Youngstown. I had the best fans that you could anybody could possibly have. Um, your loyal fans here, it's amazing, but um, it, it is what it is. Uh, so you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. And it's just uh, one of those things. And those are a couple of the cases. Um, you know, it's um, no, not a, a big deal anymore. You know, it's, I don't – don't phase me. I'm doing what I'm doing. I was fortunate and I lived my life and, and I'm, uh, I'm happy. But, uh, you know, so but when I bring it up, I know people say, like, oh, well, you're bringing it up because it bothers you. It did bother me, but now I'm just talking on it. You know what I mean? It, it's not that you're bothered. It's just I'm calling it how it is. And, uh, you know, it, but the whole – the main thing about the whole situation is you got to – for this goes for anybody. You just got to keep doing what you're doing. You know what I mean? Um, I, I after I retired, I stayed in Youngstown. A lot of people wouldn't have. Um, I didn't care. You know, to me, it's not, I don't think I, moving to Los Angeles or New York or or um, Orlando, Florida, is like the thing to do. You know, I got a family here. I got kids there. I got a huge family. Um, I, I'm able to go wherever I want and, and stay where I want. Um, I don't have to relocate for a job or anything like that. I, I'm re I retired at 30. That pisses a lot of people off here. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it is what it is. So I, I just call it how it is. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good. It's, it's a good insight into it. I mean, I can, yeah, I, I knew there was going to be pros and cons to the whole process, but it's, it's really interesting to, uh, it is. to hear them, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I go, that's just not me. That, that, that's uh, any, you know, at athletes, unfortunately, fall in a different, um, a little different situation. And, and it's, uh, I, I would say it's unfair, and it is, but it, it is what it is, too. It's been that way for a long time, but. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about um, about a few fights then. I mean, I know, obviously, there's, there's too many to, to talk about them all, uh, but just a couple of key ones. One of the first ones I'd like to ask you about is uh, – obviously Edison Miranda. Now, the reason I bring that one up is I think a lot of people go jump straight to obviously the two Taylor fights. They jumped to Hopkins, jumped to this, that, and the other. But obviously I remember when you fought Edison, I mean, no one gave you a chance. People, people wrote you off. Um, you know, he, and, and obviously the thing that people um, watching this may or may not remember is at that time, the amount of hype around him and, and you know, the way he was being built up, some of which I think was actually justified was massive but then obviously you know you won the fight you stopped him and more than that you actually um you know backed him up and, and dominated so what i find interesting about that is um obviously the fight itself but also your mentality going into it um because the mental side of fighting is something that, that interests me a great deal um so the mental side going into it and then and then the fight itself um what are your thoughts on that side of things champ you hit right on the head, too. I mean, a lot of people don't uh, bring up on that fact. You know, Miranda at that time was the monster. I mean, he, mm -hmm. he beat Alan Green, who was a, a good yeah. fighter. He, he beat Arthur Abraham over in Germany. Uh, it's unfortunate he didn't get the decision. Uh, it's almost impossible over there to get a decision. So going into that fight, um, we were the underdog. People were looking past. I had every bit the same, if not higher, knockout percentage in Miranda. But nobody was talking about my power, you know. And, and the whole thing was that he's a monster and that he's going to probably walk through me and then do the same thing to Jermaine Taylor at that point. I mean, Miranda, was, there was nobody that could beat him in some of the people's eyes. Um, we went into that fight, and uh, we, we had a game plan. Our game plan was to back him up and show people that we were the stronger, harder puncher, and more durable guy. Um, and another reason for that game plan was Miranda threw looping wide punches. It was dangerous, you know. So sometimes staying on the outside and, and trying to move, you could have went right into the one of those looping right hands. Um, we, I realized watching film that Miranda couldn't fight going backwards. You know, and uh, so that was a bit, not a lot of people can, but that was the big thing. Um, and nobody ever tried pushing Edison Miranda back. And, you know, we did that and we were successful in it. Yeah, it makes sense. It's a good game plan. It's a fantastic game plan. And I mean, going into the fight itself, um, you know, before that, I mean, your mental um, sort of your mindset going into it, were you nervous? Did you feel the pressure or were you very, very confident that you'd uh, get the win? Well, you always hear fighters say they they don't get nervous. There are some guys. Uh, that's bullshit. Um, every fighter gets nervous before a fight. It's human nature. Um, they wouldn't be able to perform as good as they do if they weren't. 
You know what I mean by that? They'd be yeah. very lethargic and uh, whatnot. It's uh, uh, yeah, nervous. You know, especially because the game plan. You know, the game plan again was kind of like I don't know how to say, but you know, you're going into battle and you're going to take shots mm-hmm. uh, because our game plan was to back Miranda up. Well, if you're going to walk somebody backwards, you know you're going to get hit with punches. Um, so yeah, it was uh, <laughs> it was a gut check, and uh, you know we got through it. So it was able to. Uh, go in there and fight them and, and do what we have to do. Mm. Brilliant. Now, another one is obviously um, obviously the world title win itself. I mean, that's not that's no surprise to you that, to ask about that. But, you know, beating Jermaine Taylor, um, you know, winning the world title, because and I know that that in itself, people always ask you about this, but I'm factoring in all the years of hard work. I mean, I when I was researching this, I watched another interview where you said early in your career, you're working in construction and doing all these things. You sacrificed, you sacrificed a lot, you know, different things. So obviously to finally get there, to finally get to the, you know, the top of the mountain, beat such an all-time great as that. Um, I'm actually going to ask from a different perspective because the fight itself was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. But I've, I have got to ask, I mean, when you knew that you'd won, what actually went through your mind? And that's a little bit different than, than asking about the fight itself. But what did it actually feel like in that moment? Oh, man, there's so many different emotions. That's another one where you can't really explain. It's just uh, everything goes 10,000 miles an hour. Um, you're, you're all over. You got, you got so many emotions going through your body and in your head. And uh, especially the way that fight took place you know and everything that happened all the events throughout the fight that that happened um yeah it, it's just a crazy feeling like you're not you're absorbing it but you're not absor- absorbing it and you know you just accomplished something but it, it it don't kick in and you can't set in and it's hard so you're just like really excited almost about nothing but you're excited about winning a world title and you know it don't it don't really sink into a good time a good amount of time after yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I've heard different world champions describe it different ways, but a lot of them do say that you just, you almost can't put it into words. Um, yeah, you know, good yeah, enough for the experience. yeah, you know, and I, I know what you mean. Because, you know, it's a, it's a long road. And especially like for me, I mean, I had, I was seven years, you know, yeah. it took me to get that shot. A lot of people think that my career started in 2007. You know, a lot of people say, oh, he retired too soon and he didn't do this. And, you know, I had 42 pro fights and I was pro over 12 years. Mm. That's a long time, um, super long time. And, uh, you know, for me, before I got that shot, that was seven years, you know, I was pro. So it's a lot of work. There's a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. You're carrying a lot of pressure um, to stay undefeated, to stay in contention for the world title shot. Um, then you have other guys that turn pro a couple months after, like, like Jermaine Taylor and I'm who fought for a world title two years earlier than that, you know, against Hopkins. So you're, there's a lot of pressure, a lot of uh, nerves. It's really hard in that game to, to stay undefeated that long. Um, and then when you finally get it, it's just, it's overwhelming. Yeah, I can imagine. But now another one, um, I mean, obviously I'm in Wales, so I've got to ask you uh, about this one, about Gary Lockett. Um, I'm sure that's no surprise either, uh, but I just want to get that in there. Um, and I mean, I know, um, and then and then Hopkins, obviously we'll get to in a minute. Yeah. But starting with um, starting with, with Gary Lockett, I mean, that fight, um, it's just interesting because on a personal note, I've obviously I know him, I've heard his side of the story. Um, your side of the story, I mean, obviously it was a fantastic win, um, great defense, um, obviously got him out of there early but uh, yeah i mean your side of the story what did you what did you think of your performance um in that fight itself well, i thought it was spot on um gary was a good fighter you know a lot of people try to give me crap look at his record um i'm sure enzo don't didn't train anybody you know um especially at that time joe was one of the hottest things in boxing our fighters uh you know i i gary i, I like the kid he's uh the guy he's um cool you know what i mean i I seen him we were actually together at dallas for the um, mikey garcia fight yeah and um got to talk to him and meet and it's always great when you're able after two people shared what we did in the ring to be able to just you know come back and talk to each other and and everything uh so yeah i thought i mean i thought it was spot on unfortunately for gary that was probably one of my best feeling nights that i had you know what i mean i just felt i was on on fire that night um 
I felt great. And uh, it, it was a you know a big win. I think that it, it helped me winning like that because not how I feel, but how the media would have taken it. Yeah. If I would have went ten rounds with Gary Lockett and and been a little sloppy, I would have took some harsh criticism um, because Gary wasn't a, a world champion. But mm. I knew I watched film on Gary. I knew how good Gary could fight. So. Yeah. That's good. That's good. I have to get that one in there, just uh, just from a, from a country thing. But another um, oh. another fight that obviously is is going to be as no surprise to you me asking this, but obviously Hopkins. I mean, obviously it's um, that's probably a bit of a bittersweet um, one. Now, there's a few things that just to just to drop in there. I mean, first of all, um, sharing the ring with with someone like that has got to be incredible. Obviously, it didn't go your way. A lot of people have said um, that that was part of the reason for your, your retirement. Now, I know, personally, I know that that's not accurate. Um, I know I can see how that's not accurate at all. But obviously, um, that's something, and I know you've addressed that in other interviews. Um, people should be allowed to watch boxing or sports in general. Yeah, it's, it's strange what some people come up with. I don't know, I don't know what they're... Yeah. Because obviously, yeah, I mean, you only have to look at obviously how long you were pro, the sacrifices you have to make, yeah. uh, any fighter, you know, I mean, it's, uh, I'm not going to get into that because I get on my, on my uh, high horse with that. But yeah. um, talking about um, Hopkins, though, I mean, that fight itself, obviously, it's a bit of a sweet thing. Um, but what are your thoughts on it? And again, I don't have one question because you, you had the experience, so you'll have a perspective that obviously I, I don't have. What do you think of that fight and, um, and everything about it, really? I thought that, you know, I want to try to say it because no matter what, you can never win. Um, mm. I've been retired. I've been retired uh, eight years, over eight years now. And so I'm not, what I say, and I tell people this, that I do interviews with, this is nothing to further my career or do anything. It's over. It's been over. Um, Hopkins, it was not me that night. Unfortunately, taking it away and this is where i say again with people because they they really do in with sports and um especially the uh, armchair boxers uh it gets frustrating uh it was not me and it's well documented you know what i mean like the, the commission um while well, robert garcia knows his, his his fighter fought on the undercard he was a co-main event it just wasn't me that night i wouldn't even say it was 80 percent me and i don't ever use other fights as measuring sticks but you could also but you could take something away i guess where i'm going with that is jermaine taylor beat bernard hopkins twice controversial or not he beat him twice so they were close fights um i go in i knock jermaine out seventh round and i beat him by decision does that mean that i should be able to beat bernard hopkins no it don't you know what I mean? Styles make fights. But it don't mean that Bernard Hopkins beats me as easy as he did. Okay? And everybody's seen how I looked in that fight. That don't happen. It, it shouldn't happen. Especially if I was if I was 100% that night. That wouldn't have happened. Okay, now me going in there and winning three rounds and making some of the other rounds competitive, but Bernard beats me by unanimous decision. Understandable. Okay? The way I looked in that fight, if people couldn't tell, then um, again, you know, as far as they're, they're just gone um, mentally from from the sport of boxing, and and I, and I would say sports in general, um, they shouldn't they shouldn't be allowed to watch. But um, that was the case, you know what I mean? And I'm being honest, like you don't get beat that bad coming from where how I did, and the fights the, the fights that I won is don't matter if he was a slick boxer or not. That just don't happen, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, Jermaine was was considered a boxer. He was a Olympic bronze medalist. Um, I beat him. You know, I beat guys early in my career that were uh, pretty slick guys and fast. Yeah. So, you know, and that's just where it comes down to. So, with Hopkins, yeah, people say he ruined me, but they forget that my very next fight, I knocked out Marco Antonio Rubio and I beat the crap out of him. And Marco Antonio Rubio went on to win eleven fights after that and knock out. Um, Oh my God! What's his name? To the kid that was uh, twenty-five and zero with twenty-five knockouts, Lemieux, yeah. David Lemieux, who was a, who's still in contention right now. Middleweight people talk about him, and Rubio became a world champion after that. You know, yeah. but um, so I go in there and I dominate him. If I was ruined, I don't think that I've gone ruined or beat up on Rubio like I did. You know what I mean? Oh, it's right. just 
it's ass nine and, and people sometimes when they don't know what to say they they spew things and, and that's the bottom line yeah yeah it is it is a sad um side of the sport i mean as, or any sport really as much as there's your loyal fans there's obviously as you say the armchair people and i know that there's more to it because yeah i mean the performance obviously you're the athlete so you know how your performance was better than anyone yeah. so i i i know i mean I, i've seen it in the fight but you're yeah. going on that too well i'm like that's not taking anything away from Hopkins. Oh, Hopkins yeah, yeah. did what what a uh, all time great does, you know. Like he took he took full advantage of it, and you know, and, he, and I still was able to see some of the things he did. He was slick, man. He, you know, I tell people Bernard Hopkins probably got the best footwork in boxing, and that's where another one where a lot of people don't understand. They go Bernard Hopkins footwork. Well, you don't have to be flashy to have great footwork. Not everybody has to move around like Hector Camacho or. Pernell Whitaker to have good footwork. Mm. Good footwork is those little subtle moves and, and the right foot placement at the right time that sets the other guy off and, and puts them in good position. And Bernard Hopkins is probably one of the best of all time as far as, you know, being at the right place at the right time, which involves mm. footwork. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Now, uh, obviously I am mindful of time, but there's only a couple more anyway. So we're, we should be, we should be all right. Um, Right. Now, obviously, you retired on a winning streak um, in itself, but obviously it was the right time for you to retire. Now, at the time, uh, I remember there was talk about you having seizures and having um, some degree of damage from boxing. Uh, the thing is, there's a number of reports around yourself that are obviously very exaggerated. I'm aware of that. I mean, some even some of the... Um, um, other things that have made the news, which I really wonder how in the hell they have made the news, but there we are. That's that's life. But in terms of your retirement, in your own words, how did you know it was the um, the actual correct time to retire um, at at the age that you did and everything like that? Because I was done. Um, you know, this goes back uh, when I won the world title. You know, even before the world title, I knew I didn't want to ever. Bo I didn't want to box mm. forever. Um, Everybody's different, different um, mentality. Some guys will love to fight till they're 70 if they could. Mm. Um, me, I was in it because I loved the sport of boxing. And, and obviously people could tell because every fight I was in tip-top shape. You know what I mean? I think I averaged, I was I break high for middleweights um, and punches per round as it is. So that goes to show how hard I train for, for my fights. Um, but at the same time, you know, I was a person I didn't want to stay in it long. You get guys, as I said earlier, that will go to the, to the, or, um, 90 years old if they could. When in 2007, when I won the world title, where most fighters would be counting down to that next big fight, I was counting down to the next big fight, but I wasn't counting down for it as far as to be able to go beat the next great fighter. I was counting down as the next big payday. You know what I mean? And getting out. I was I was having my exit plan after I won the world title. You know, a lot of fighters don't do that. Um, and and that, that was it. So come 2012, you know, I ended up leaving. I went to go train with uh, Robert Garcia, which was fantastic. But at that point in my career, I was up and leaving my hometown, my, my family and everything else. Um, usually you leave town when you're at the beginning of your career and you haven't made the money. You ain't got the belts all that um you don't leave when you have three real title balls sitting in a trophy case and millions in the bank so that being said i got out with robert garcia they put me in against uh a kid that wasn't a big name at all and uh it was understandable it was my first fight with a new camp so i get that then the second fight um with him was scott sigmund on espn and then then uh, after scott sigmund you have uh who was it? Uh, Roel Rosinski. Um, Roel, Roel was a good fighter, very uh, tricky and everything else. But at that point, it was just kind of – I was done, and I needed a big fight. Well, right then and there, Andre Ward was mentioned, and we were getting ready to fight Andre Ward. The, the contract was getting ready to be signed. Andre Ward hurt his shoulder and actually took some time off at that point. And, and then – so I was kind of like – I was about done there. Um, there was no other big fights outside of that. You know, I think the Super 6 tournament was still going on. Uh, no meaningful fights. At that point, I was done. I was. Like, I just didn't want to. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to get up, go all the way out west to train. Um, I, I had no more for the sport. And 
of course, you know, all the shit, the speculations and everything. Um, but is, so no matter what, if I, if I would have stayed fighting for eight more years, 10 more years, then I would have been punchy and nobody would want nothing to do with me. You retire too early. Um, I guess 42 pro fights, 12 years in the sport of boxing is not long. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, it's just it's the way it is. Uh, yeah. So I, I knew I was done. Um, I took the three, I took three, four years away from it. And I can admit on that, that, um, I lived in that period of time, boy, uh, you know, a, a little immature, but I, I lived and I, and I had fun, but it also started getting just crazy, you know, um, mainly from the, the local media, the, no matter what, if I pissed in the wrong direction, it was um, headlines and I could get into that in more detail. Um, but I will save it for another time. So yeah, I hung them up and uh, I was done. And then, probably after three, four years after all the little incidents and I call them cause they were little incidents. Um, I had to pull my head out of my ass. I really did. You know, it was time to get moving. So that's where I was fortunate to where I could uh, go and make investments and own my own businesses. And, and that's what I do now. And I got busy again, you know, I, I started doing things. I got involved back in the sport with the podcast, doing that. We travel, we cover the fights and, you know, now it's back to having fun. Good stuff. Good stuff. All yeah. right. So um, the only other one is, um, well, I say that, there's one other thing, is uh, advice for young um, pros. I mean, this is something that I like to ask the, the champs. I like to ask people that have made it to the top of the mountain and, and you know, done everything you've achieved, made the big money, you know, done every, you know, had, had the, fought the legends. Is If you had advice for um, people that are, early on in boxing, you know, maybe they're still amateur, maybe they, you know, just turning professional, having the first few fights, whatever. And obviously they want to get to the, um, you know, the top of the mountain. I mean, there's, there's no one better to ask than someone like yourself. So what would be one or two tips that, you know, essential tips that you'd, you'd give out? You know, the big thing with, with uh, boxing, professional boxing, uh, especially, is X's and O's are great. Don't get me wrong. Um, learning that, the being into boxing gym, um, that, that's where, you know, you study on your opponent and film and you work on things. But that, that's really a small part of it because most of the people that are young pros that are prospects that are good or probably signed with a promotional company, chances are they know how to fight. <laughs> okay, so chances are they had 60, 70 amateur fights. Um, the big thing is the extra work that you do outside of, of the boxing gym. That's huge. Being able to be a step faster, a, a bit stronger, um, to be able to go harder during that round and being in, in great shape and condition is great because if not, you could have Floyd Mayweather and Roy Jones Jr.'s skills all put into one. And if you get tired, it's no good. You know what I mean? So it's really, really important to put that extra work in um, when you're coming up and make sure that um, you're training, like I said, outside the boxing gym to make sure you're doing all the other things that, especially in this day and age where these athletes are getting faster, stronger, and in most sports they're getting bigger and it's just science and it's the way it's happening. Um, you got to try to stay a step ahead of them you know what I mean to be able to compete and that's the big thing just making sure that you're 100% in shape and ready to go that's one of the biggest things with boxing because we've seen many many great fighters and very talented fighters who just after a handful of rounds were shot you know and uh, that's the biggest part really is it's simple people don't you know I say that and, and um, they go oh, well we know that but do they really know I don't I don't know you know well, it's one thing knowing it, and it's one thing putting it into into practice. Sure. And I mean, you hear stories like, uh, just as an example, I'm good friends with um, Steve Robinson, former WBO featherweight champion. I mean, he took that on two days' notice, and the only reason he could, and he won the you know the world title on two days' notice. The only reason he could is because he was so fit. He was always in the gym. He's always in shape. Um, you know, and it's it's a prime example. So that's good. Now, the, the last thing is just anything you're doing now that you want to mention. I mean, I mentioned your podcast earlier. You mentioned the gym. Yeah. You know, we mentioned that, and I know, I know, time's tight. So, just a last plug for anything you want to say. Uh, first oh, of I appreciate it. For your fans and anything about um, what you're doing as it is at the moment. Well, all the fans, I want to thank everybody for being a fan. Yeah, man. Um, so, you got to fitness gym. Um, 
we got the podcast. Uh, we got uh, I got an app out called the Sweet Science Plus. It's a really good app. It's a boxing tutorial, and on top of that, we also have a diet plan and um, uh, and diet, diet recipe and recipes also on that. It's really cool. I mean, you don't get many apps like that. Me and Billy Lau, who was a former fighter, he beat John Duddy. And uh, yeah, Billy, you know, we, we put this together. We put a lot of work behind it. So, yeah, it's called the Sweet Science Plus. And, and now we're getting ready to get behind it again and start marketing it. Um, me and a, a buddy of mine, uh, Coach Jess Leon, right now, one of the biggest things that we got going, that I got going is, is that uh, sports testing throughout the country. Um, it's kind of like the NFL combine type testing, but we do it for all sports. So every sport has its own specific different drills, and we do the testing on that. And right now it's taken off. I mean, I've been all over for that. And uh, what else? Oh, I got my charitable organization and getting ready to – um, hopefully by summertime, have my boxing gym up and going with that charitable organization and also in the process of maybe opening another fitness gym. So I'm spread thin. I'm like an octopus. I got hands that all stands. So. <laughs> uh, brilliant. That's, that's a, a nice problem to have though, isn't it? I mean, you know, if yeah. it's not surprised, that's good. Brilliant. Well, um, like I say, champ, I mean, that's, that's everything I wanted to cover. Um, I mean, I oh, actually saying that I forgot to ask you about your toughest fight, but um, uh, I forgot to ask you which the toughest one was, but you, you probably, you know, you probably, I would, you know, obviously Martinez and, and Hopkins is in there, but you know, the Taylor, Taylor fights were, were uh, tough. And then the hardest puncher for sure though, which makes the fight tough is, is uh, Edison Miranda. I mean, he hits you, you carry that, those punches for a couple of days after. So oh, yeah. I just wanted to get that one in. Well, you know, like I say, thank you very much for your time. Um, I really, really appreciate it because I know you've sort of squeezed me in. Um, no yeah, I, I appreciate you making the time for it. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel and there'll be more videos coming soon.